The Carlisle Indian Industrial School, both a genuine mouthful and a particularly shameful piece of American history. In recent years, there has been a resurgence in countries dealing with their past transgressions against Native populations. Particularly in Canada in the last 10 years, citizens, the government, and Native tribes have been reckoning with their history of residential schools. Some of your students may have heard about this in the news or perhaps discussed it in one of their classes. The United States had its own system of off-reservation boarding schools with its own shameful history. The Carlisle School opened in 1879 as the first government-run boarding school for Native Americans. It served as a model for hundreds more that would soon open around the country. A defunct army barracks in Carlisle, Pennsylvania was transferred to the Bureau of Indian Affairs as the site for the school, and Lieutenant Colonel Richard Henry Pratt was tasked with leading the school and recruiting students. Pratt was a veteran of both the Civil War and the Indian Wars and a firm believer in assimilation. Pratt is most famous for his mantra, kill the Indian, save the man, which signified his belief that Native American culture and heritage needed to be wiped out for Native Americans to join white society. While Pratt's views are abhorrent in their own way, they were in stark contrast to arguably worse feelings at the time from many other citizens of the United States, who believed that Native Americans were genetically and irredeemably less than the white race. A large portion of the goal of this school was to prove that assimilation of Native Americans was in fact possible. A major theme of these lessons is assimilation and its racist nature may be upsetting to your students. History is rarely black and white, good and evil, and acknowledging that assimilation ran counter to very popular, even more racist ideas complicates the situation in a way that is valuable for your students to learn to work through. Students came to Carlisle under a variety of different circumstances. Some parents saw the school as an opportunity for their children to learn and get a leg up on being successful in the continually more complicated situation their tribes found themselves in. In many situations, however, families and tribes were intimidated and threatened into sending their children to Pennsylvania. Similarly, children of important tribal leaders were taken to the school as a means of ensuring obedience by the tribes, essentially making them hostages in Carlisle. On arrival, students were forced to abandon their cultures, language, clothing, and religion. Following the military nature of the school buildings and its founder, students were given short haircuts, dressed in military-style uniforms, and subjected to harsh discipline. Many students fell ill and died while at the school due to poor sanitation and sudden exposure to new diseases and cramped barracks. A cemetery was started on the school grounds that eventually held the remains of 186 students, some with unmarked graves, which speaks further to the level of care students were receiving at the school. Hallmarks of the Carlisle School were its football team and marching band, which traveled the country serving as examples of successful assimilation. The football team enjoyed a lot of success under famous coach Pop Warner, with Jim Thorpe, a player and student at the Carlisle School, going on to play professional football and becoming the first Native American to win a gold medal at the Olympics for the United States. The marching band even performed at the presidential inauguration every four years while the school was open. Students may be curious what the school day was like at Carlisle. A congressional investigation in 1914 lambasted the school for poor educational outcomes, declining attendance, and poor morale. Additionally, many students chose to run away from the school, attempting to make it back to their families and reservations all the way from Pennsylvania. While thousands of students attended Carlisle from 1879 to 1918 when it finally closed, only 158 students ever graduated. That being said, several important Native American rights activists attended Carlisle and went on to fight for their people after leaving the school. The school did finally close in 1918 for a number of reasons. Primarily, more schools had opened up elsewhere in the country following Carlisle's example. Often these schools were closer to tribal lands, meaning it no longer made sense to have students travel all the way to Pennsylvania. The congressional investigation I mentioned also spurred the closing, along with further declining attendance as the United States entered World War I in 1917. After its closing, the buildings were transferred back to the U.S. Army as a rehabilitation hospital for injured soldiers. Currently, the site is home to the U.S. Army War College, Nearby Dickinson College does a lot of research around the school. The cemetery at the school entered the news several years ago and as tribes fought to have the remains of their children who died at the school repatriated. The government declined their requests over and over until finally the activists wore them down and bodies are now being repatriated to their original tribes. The goal of teaching this material to our students is first to provide a full and honest picture of the relationship between Native Americans and the federal government and the role assimilation played. Additionally, as students themselves, you may find your students identifying with the Native American children. This allows an opportunity to practice historical empathy while finding the appropriate balance with historical analysis. This history, and particularly the photographs of students, also provide a good entry point into doing difficult history because the topics are heavy, intense, and central to our nation's history, but there is not graphic depiction of violence. Use these lessons as an opportunity to engage your students and understand their emotions while working with historical documents and collaborating with their peers to make sense of this difficult history.